We are going to energize the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. The independence case is a powerful one. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast, the first of 2022. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Brett Meyer, a research fellow at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, to discuss his latest paper on populism, a playbook against populism, populist leadership in decline in 2021. Welcome to the podcast, Brett. Thank you for having me, Will. It's nice to be here. It's great to have you on. Um, Now, the first question that I'd like to ask is, in terms of populism and the papers that you have done on populism, both this one and uh, prior papers. Why do you think it's important to keep a track of populism around the world, how it is um, evolving in different countries and how it differs from country to country? Yeah, I think this is very important. I mean, for some practical reasons, but just, you know, generally, um, it's, I mean, it's a topic that's been become a of a lot of interest to people in recent years. I mean, there have been some major leaders that everyone around the world that everyone pretty much recognizes as populist because, you know, they use heated rhetoric. They're very divisive, some of these core concepts of populism. And so people have become really interested in this. And I think it's important to, you know, we have a lot of data sets on democracy and, you know, different ways of classifying democracy, but we didn't really have a lot that systematically tries to classify leaders as populists. Mm. So we thought that this was an important thing to do. I mean, even, you know, aside from the general interest in the past few years, it was an important concept before that. I mean, Mm. going back 20, 30 years, even more in Latin America. Mm. So we thought it was a good idea to create a data set like this for the practical reason that scholars and others would be interested in, in using it. Um, but also just to keep track of these things. And also, I think an important part is to shed light on lesser known cases. Hmm. So we really, and I actually wasn't involved with the original work in creating the data set, uh, a former colleague of mine and some some research assistants did it. But uh, in their research, they found a lot of cases that were, you know, leaders hmm. who were, you know, you used heated rhetoric, were divisive, that people wouldn't have known about. So, hmm. I mean, um, I think the data set is, is very good because it, it you know, sheds a lot of light on some of these lesser known cases. Mm. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting as well in terms of the data set is that it demonstrates that in terms of um, uh, populist uh, leaders were at a, a, a point um, that's not only comparable to, to 2004 in terms of the low of um, populist leaders. And one of the reasons um, that you argue uh, in the paper that we're seeing such a sort of a, a, a low in terms of populist leaders is how populists have handled COVID and how they haven't quite been able to um, seriously um, deal with it because of obviously the nature of them of being populist leaders. Why do you think it's been so difficult for populist leaders to be able to find some narrative that they could create around COVID that would not only be successful in terms of defeating um, the virus, but also in terms of retaining their coalition of support. So it's interesting with populist leaders and COVID. I wrote a report on how populist leaders dealt with COVID back in August 2020. Mm. And I mean, the goal, what I was trying to do there is, I mean, okay, so in the first like two weeks of of COVID, you have a bunch of op-eds coming out saying that this is going to be the death knell of populism because these guys, you know, they don't care about health policy. Mm. They just, you know, they just like to yell at reporters. They're not going to take this seriously. And this is the time when you need serious politicians. I'm like, okay, well, we have 17 of these guys in power. Let's just see if that's (laughs) actually true for all of them. And I found that their responses to populism, or I'm sorry, the populist leaders' responses to COVID, at least in those first few months, differed a lot. I mean, you had some like Trump and Bolsonaro who really downplayed it and like were, you know, they they it put them on the defensive very quickly. Uh, but then you had others like, you know, Modi in India and Viktor Orban, uh, who used it as an opportunity to really sort of lock down and crack down, right? Mm, I mean, some people would say to like, you know, these are leaders with strong authoritarian impulses. Well, this gave them an opportunity to, an excuse to exercise Mm. them, right? You know, like, you know, it's a state of emergency and an authoritarian minded person should love a state of of Mm. emergency because you can take take advantage of it. I mean, so yeah, the initial lockdowns in India were very strict. 
Um, Orban took some pretty extensive emergency powers. But I get to get back to your original point. I mean, there they finding a narrative about COVID. I mean, that was. I'm not sure about a narrative, but they some of these leaders, the, I would say the smarter ones, really used it to their advantage. I think the like Trump and Bolsonaro really got caught on the wrong foot. And I thought they should have maybe acted more like Viktor Orban and Modi mm. for their own sake. I mean, I thought throughout, you know, 2020 into early this year that Trump probably lost. I think if he had done this, he would have had a better chance of winning. Mm. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but who knows? But uh I, I always thought then a lot of other people raised that point too. Um, but I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's tough for a lot of these guys to deal with something like this because, you know, they come, they don't, you know, come to office on, you know, their substantive expertise on their, for their, you know, seriousness yeah. in health policy. I mean, they have populists around the world have no health policy. It's just not a, a topic yeah. they are concerned much with. So that, I mean, that would be, one reason why you'd think it would be hard for them to find their footing, but I think a lot of them did anyway. Mm. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I this because I'd like you to have the opportunity to ask more questions. But yeah, yet, I mean, even a lot of those leaders that took it seriously in the beginning, I found in a piece I published this summer, like India, uh, Hungary, these countries still ended up with higher COVID death rates, hmm. you know, as time yeah. went on. Not in the first wave. They didn't. Eastern Europe didn't get the first wave. India didn't get the first wave. But then they got it really bad in like winter 2020 into 2021. And these countries have these populist led countries have some of the highest death rates. And I found that yeah. populist leaders have higher COVID death rates, at least through this past summer than yeah. countries with non populist leaders, which was actually I was kind of surprised to find yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, in, in terms of Trump, just focusing on him in particular, because he's perhaps one of the um, best known examples of a populist leader. Do you think then that um, COVID has permanently scarred his appeal to the American people? Or do you think, as some people have been suggesting, that he may make uh, a reappearance this year, whether through um being potentially selected as um, Speaker of the House if the Republicans manage to um, gain control of the House again, or whether starting to build up more momentum to attempt to take uh, the Republican nomination for 2024. So do you, do you think he's been permanently uh, scarred for the American people in terms of popularity, or do you think he could potentially somehow uh, find a way to, to get back into power? Well, I was thinking about this this morning because there's an interesting, he's been getting a lot of attention lately for his talking about COVID. Mm. And the attention has been because he's been going on all these conservative, like, you know, shows, yeah. radio shows and television shows and saying like, yeah, I got vaccinated. The vaccines have saved millions of lives. You're an idiot if you didn't get vaccinated. He's telling this to people who are, you know, like mm. anti-vaxxers, yeah. like Candace Owen, this right-wing entertainer, um, she's like an anti-vaxxer and her support, a lot of her followers are. And then he comes on and says, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was basically, yeah, I got vaccinated. You should too. Vaccines are great. Um, and I mean, in a sense, so the, 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 the thought I had about this this morning is that he's like trying to position himself to be, a, to seem a bit more reasonable to people mm -hmm. in the future. Cause he's obviously got the populist cred and he's not going to lose. I don't think he's going to lose his base, uh, it seems like they'll follow him whatever he does. Yeah. But then this this might you might look at this as one way to start to appeal to more like you know centrist people because he lost them. In the, mm. He lost a lot of these people. I mean, so it could be a strategy. I think. I mean, and that's a good strategy. I think mm. if it is, but I think also Trump is just it's not actually inconsistent with what he's been saying all along. He's never been anti-vax. He's always, yeah. he always promoted the vaccines. He thinks he hasn't gotten enough credit for them existing in the first place. He was complaining about that before he even lost the election, mm. or as he would put it, didn't lose the election. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, so I mean, the issue with Trump, that, okay, so there's that. I mean, that's some interesting stuff to think through there. The issue with Trump in 2024 is you have to remember how American elections work and that we, we have essentially have a two round election system mm. where you have primary elections within party but even those rules differ by state because some states allow anyone to vote in a party's primary election, yeah. some yeah. it to the party members. Um, so, I mean, Trump will get be the nominee based on what primarily, you know, it, 
partisans in the Republican Party want, because those are the people who turn out to vote in these these primary elections. I mean, I think the odds of him getting the nomination in 2024 are very good. Uh, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Mm, yeah. Um, uh, turning back to um, the paper, one of the interesting things that I thought is the way that populism is um, defined and that you have three subcategories, cultural mm-hmm. populism, socioeconomic populism, and anti-establishment populism. I'm just curious, which do you think is um, the most um, appealing to people who may be susceptible to populism? Because, of course, with um, cultural populism, you've got a lot of things intertwined with that, particularly um, in the US with the um, the idea of, as, as you mentioned before, um, these right-wing uh, commentators, Tucker Carlson, other people of a similar creed, um, attacking, you know, sort of like what they perceive as these liberal biases or, or wokeness and all that sort of thing. Do you think that that is perhaps the most um, motivating factor for why people support populist candidates? Or do you think that it's more socioeconomic populism, because, I mean, obviously we've been talking about Trump just now, and a lot of people who um, felt left out uh, from the uh, economic revival under Obama uh, decided to support Trump because they thought, oh, this is this great businessman who will, um, you know, bring back um, all these jobs that we've lost, that will bring back coal mining, et cetera, et cetera. So which do you think is the most potent for people in terms of attracting them to a populist candidate? I mean, I think that differs by country context mm. a bit. Um, I mean, they can, you often have times in a country where both appeal to, you know, different people. I mean, mm. a lot of people would say Bernie Sanders was kind of a socioeconomic populist. So that appealed to a lot of people. And interestingly, some of the same people to whom Trump also yeah. appealed. Yeah. Um, but then, I mean, if you go through, like, look at Latin America through, you know, much of the past few decades, I mean, you have these, like, socio these left-wing socioeconomic populists who are just as much of firebrands, more so than Trump, like Hugo Chavez. Um, and uh, so that appealed to a lot of people. Um, I think it seems to me like in the West, like Western Europe, in the Western democracies, the cultural populism seems a little bit more appealing. Mm. And I think that's because of this sort of this backdrop of what's been going on the last 40 or 50 years about, uh, you know, sort of the changing structure of the labor market. And, you know, people had these very good jobs that, you know, didn't require particularly high levels of education. Mm. So you could have, you know, you know, good good income, good social status, you know, this kind of stuff without, you know, too much education, but that the sort of opportunities for those people have declined. And there's been a lot of work on this. I mean, all this stuff by, you know, economist David Otter about the, you know, the decline of the labor market for people, you know, who perform routine tasks. And then a lot of, a lot of research have incorporated this work into the study of politics and find that, you know, these areas that lost a lot of these jobs, oh, now they're more likely to vote for Republicans, mm-hmm. even though you think, wait, but the Republicans are the right wing economic party. Um, so, and I mean, there's some very interesting work that even shows that a lot of these cultural attitudes, these more conservative cultural attitudes are, they, you get, you get them uh, spreading in response to these same economic shocks, um, which is a very interesting thing to think about, like how that might be working in people's minds. Uh, I mean, you can, a very simple story is like, well, you know, sort of the good old days, things were more, you know, culturally conservative, mm. although we didn't think about we didn't think about it in those terms. That's just the way they were back then. And now, you know, we've lost our jobs. Things are kind of crap. And, you know, there's, you know, so we become more anti, I don't know, people, you know, with too many degrees living in mm. cities because they seem to be running everything. I mean, there's a fantastic paper, new paper that just come out uh, on the Internet. It's not even published yet by a, a scholar in uh, Israel. His name is Yotam Margalit and some co-authors that tried to assess these like different types of cultural explanations for why people support populists. Mm-hmm. So is it, you know, is it about, you know, rural resentment, people in rural areas, you know, support these guys? Is it about, you know, you know, issues with, you know, cultural liberalism? Yeah. Is it mostly about immigration? And they go down and break down these, by uh, these different explanations and they find it most you know, immigrants and then also rural resentment not so much cultural conservatism generally, fantastic new paper. But uh, I mean, yeah, I think both, you know, so both the sort of economic populism and cons- and culturally conservative populism can appeal to people. I mean, in the same place at the same time, but the country context matters mm. too. So. Yeah, of course. Um, you mentioned Latin America then. I think perhaps the most prominent 
populist currently uh, in Latin America is obviously Bolsonaro uh, mm-hmm. in Brazil. And he's, of course, facing re-election this year. The polling is going to um, suggest that he will most likely lose the election. But of course, similar to Trump, will probably uh, declare uh, it fraudulent if he does um, lose. Though, of course, similar to Trump, um, because of his limited power in um, Parliament and the judiciary, he's probably likely to end up um, being removed. But in terms of Bolsonaro, his argument that he made, for example, um, the clearance of the Amazon rainforest, that, oh, well, Western Europe did this hundreds of years ago, I'm simply trying to improve, you know. The- I thought that was very clever, a very clever response, because he's right yeah. about that. Yeah, no, th- that was the point that I was just going to, to come on to. Do you think sometimes when you have um, populists who are perhaps a bit, a, a bit more intelligent than other ones, that they're able to find arguments that people who don't agree with most of the uh, you know, things that they would advocate for or suggest, that they're able to come across these points that people think, well, actually, they have got a bit of a point, or you can see where they're coming from, and that then uh, weakens sometimes the uh, ability to attack them if there is this particular point where you think, well, they have got a point there. You know what? Yes, they do. I mean, Trump said some, I mean, I remember back in the primaries when he was running, he said some just like Trump is, you know, as a lot of people would, as everyone recognizes, full of crap in a lot of ways. But he also has the ability to say some like extraordinarily true things that like no one will ever say. And I just remember back to one of the early primaries when, you know, the, the auditorium, like, I, I think it was Jeb Bush's donors bought all the seats and gave, like, gave out free tickets to the people who would support him. Mm. And, and so people are booing Trump when he speaks. And he's like, you know what? That's just Jeb Bush's guys. His donors bought all the seats. I mean, we tried to get tickets for our people. We couldn't because we bought them up. So, And it's just, yeah, but here's the thing about this. One, the thing I've really learned about politics generally the last, uh, you know, decade or two mm. Is that you never underestimate people's ability to just ignore things that are inconvenient to them, to just like try to silence anything that doesn't work, not even silence, but just ignore it. I mean, ignoring things is a great tactic for, you know, people who have a big audience who something comes along that's unfavorable to them. They'll just change the topic. They'll ignore Mm -hmm. it altogether. I mean, people are very good tactically in these kind of situations. Mm -hmm. So populists do often say things that uh, are, you know, you know, remarkably true. And I thought that that Bolsonaro statement is an example of this. I'm like, you're absolutely right about this. How much, how much old growth forest is left in England? Yeah, yeah pretty much zero. So who are you to lecture us about that? Mm. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, but then again, of course, yeah, so they do say these things that, you know, ring true to a lot of people. Uh, of course, the you know, their, their political opponents, they just ignore them or talk about something else. They, mm. they just, they People are very good at, you know, tactically disposing of this kind of stuff. Um, Of course, the interesting question then is like, what do you like normal people who aren't, you know, listening to these, these, you know, idiots on MSNBC or Fox News, do normal people hear this and like, yeah, he's got a good point. I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind because, you know, no one is interested in talking to normal people because normal people don't make for a compelling, you know, debate or, you know, Hmm. compelling quotes or any of this. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you think then that that's part of the reason that um, populists are able to uh, appeal quite often to uh, seemingly normal people? Is that because they seem to reach out to them in a way that perhaps some of the more uh, political elites are a bit more nervous about? And that's one of the issues that has to be um, gotten across um, if you want to oppose populists, is that you have to reach out to ordinary people and you have to have more of a dialogue with them than perhaps some uh, establishment politicians in uh, the UK, in the US, France, et cetera, have a tendency not to always do. Yeah, I mean, so this is just like the story, the basic story that I think is still probably right about like why Trump won in 2016 and then why Biden won in 2020. Trump won in 2016 because, you know, he appealed to these people and like, I'm from suburbs of Detroit. Macomb Mm. County, Michigan is like, you know, a very blue collar areas where a lot of, you know, car manufacturing plants still are. The very blue collar area, I mean, mostly votes for Democrats, swung to Trump in, you know, 2020. I mean, they also voted for Reagan back in Mm. the 80s. Yeah. Um, 
he appealed to people in those kinds of places. Uh, I mean, he's like, yeah, these trade deals have been ripping this country apart. I mean, look, all these politicians, Republican and Democrats, they've been signing the same stuff for the last 40 years. Uh, and they're all the same. If you elect me, I'm <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I mean, I'm just, clearly I'm just, I don't come from this, you know, corrupt establishment like these guys. So, uh, yeah, I mean, people hear that and they're like, you know what? Yeah, thanks. It is, has pretty much been all the same thing for the last 40 years. I'll take a chance on this guy. And I mean, you see that the areas, these Rust Belt areas are where he did so well in 2016. But then, you know, you come to 2020 and Joe Biden, I mean, to his credit, I mean, he's as establishment as you can get, but he's always, you know, been like, He's from these areas in Pennsylvania. He's he's from these kind of blue collar uh, areas, and uh, this is where he's always he's always tried to appeal to these people. These are kind of the people he's always tried to represent, and uh, so yeah, I mean he's very establishment, but he's also he he played back to that. I mean I think because everyone said immediately when after the 2016 election that this is what Hillary Clinton screwed up. I mean yeah. my yeah. senator, well yeah from Michigan, Gary Peters, uh, was like. <laughs> He, I don't remember if he sent me an email or wrote a piece, uh, not me an email, sent everyone an email on his mailing list, or wrote a piece saying like, you know what the problem with Hillary Clinton was? She didn't turn up to any union meetings in Macomb County. We would have loved to have had her, but she didn't show up. So, I mean, I think it, people understood, people thought very quickly that this like lack of reaching out to these kind of people was a problem and they were susceptible to Trump. But look, they were also, it's not like they're, you know, they're, you have this issue a bit with like John, Boris Johnson and the Red Wall. These people mm -hmm. are not necessarily is forever or the conservative parties forever. Uh, they yeah. can easily <laughs> go back the other way. Do you think then that this is something that progressives really have to um, learn if they want to engage um, with people that they have perhaps lost in the past is that they need to realize that, you know, sometimes it isn't just all about, um, say perhaps um, saying uh, the exact thing that maybe a lot of members of their uh, party uh, want them to say, but sometimes it's saying things that the voters want them to say as well. And do you think that that's the issue as to why we have seen um, populists uh, sweep into power uh, in certain elections and then be swept out of power when their opponents realise that actually, if we focus on this particular uh, issue, that you know, people want support on, they want uh, a message that is in direct opposition uh, to populists, that if we take this message and oppose it with uh, populist leaders, that we will actually get those voters to swing back to us. I mean, you certainly, I mean, this is kind of a bit the same kind of thing. You certainly mm. hear this a lot. Uh, yeah. Running up to the 2020 election, a lot of, a lot of people on of the Democrat, a lot of the Democrats are like, yeah, we need we need someone who's going to appeal to these areas that we lost. And it's, you know, not Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and they were, I think they were absolutely right about that. I mean, the problem with this, I mean, so let's just talk about progress, the progressive side though. So the labor party and then the mm -hmm. Democrats, the problem with this is that the activists in these parties and a lot of the donors also in the United States, and I'm sure this is the same way in the UK mm -hmm. are very much, you know, very much on the cultural left and a lot of them are not so motivated by economic issues. I mean, a lot of these people, the donors are wealthy people. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, though, yeah, but all these, these, there's some research, research that shows, you know, all these tech guys, they're very culturally liberal, but they, man, they don't like unions. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. So, I mean, then the, 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 the energy coming into the, in the progressive side is all, on, you know, cultural, you know, whatever you want to call it, wokeism, liberalism. I mean, I don't, I hate, I hate, well, yeah, I don't know what to call it, whatever, yeah. you, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, no, no, your no, listeners yeah. will know what I'm talking about. They're like yeah, cultural left, let's yeah. call it that. Um, yeah, that's where the, a lot of the energy is, but, and yeah, that everyone, you know, partisans on both sides always think that the, plate, the base boost turnout is the, the way to win elections. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just, yeah, I don't think that's always right. I mean, because one of the things is like, if you, here's another thing that research shows from the United States. Um, what happens when you have extreme candidates in elections um, is, so you might think, okay, well, like partisan candidates, they boost turnout on your side. This is good. You know, you win based on turnout. What happens is they actually boost turnout. You at Maybe not more. I don't remember the exactly is more on the other side, but they also boost turnout a lot 
on the other side. So, I mean, like, let's talk, let's, let's, uh, I mean, a good example of this is France. Let's think mm. France has an election coming up in the next few months. Uh, Macron is, you have a two round electoral system where, you know, everyone runs in the first round and the top two vote getters go into the second round. Well, let's see, let's say on one, it could, three people it looks like could be in the second round. So Macron will be one. Okay, so three other people. One could be Marine Le Pen, like last time, right-wing populist. Another is Eric Zemmour, another right-wing populist. Um, and the only reason you have the two of them is because, you know, Zemmour has a huge ego, not because there's much of any difference between them. And then you have uh, Peck Kress, who's the, the Republicans candidate, the more centrist right. Um, I mean, if Macron, I'm sorry, if uh, Le Pen or Zemmour gets in the second round with with Macron, what does that do? Well, you know, everyone on the left who doesn't like any of these guys, they turn out and they vote against Le Pen and, mm -hmm. and or Zamor, and Macron wins. I mean, to me, it's more interesting if like Pecrest gets into the into mm -hmm. the second round. I mean, some of those guys may be like, uh, you know, this. What kind of choice is this? <laughs> it's yeah. a choice between like a McDonald's plain hamburger and a Burger King plain hamburger. <laughs> Why don't I just stay home? Uh, so I mean, maybe she can win because she. I don't know. This is something I was thinking about the other day. Maybe mm -hmm. she wins because like a lot of these guys just don't turn out, but they will turn out if, I mean, if it's against the right wing populace. What do you think um, ensures that there is a durabil durability for certain um, populist politicians? Because of course, some have lasted longer than others. And whilst term limits may play a certain um, role in how long uh, certain leaders are allowed to be in power. Obviously, some aren't even allowed um, to, to reach that term limit, Trump being one of the perhaps most prominent examples. Why do you think some populists stay in power much longer than others? So, I mean, the thing about pop, one of the things about populists is that they, they do hang, ar they hang around. I mean, this is something we didn't actually present it as a finding in any of our reports, but I went back and just dug up like, what was it? Like, if you have a populist in the past, what is, what are the odds that you have one in the future? And it's like, you know, it's, it's very, it's pretty high. I mean, so populism seems to be get populism. Now, one of the ways that that happens is of course you get a populist on one side, that's what happened in Latin America. And then you get a populist on others, the other side, you know, who runs against that populist. So you get left wing versus right wing populism. But I mean, a lot of these guys, I mean, look, these populists get into power in the first place because they're you know, they're very charismatic popular politicians. They're very charismatic. They they draw a strong following. They build a strong base of support. Uh, and what you find in case after case, and I talk about this in the report this past year, these guys who lost like Babish in the Czech Republic, Netanyahu, these were still the politicians in their country that got the highest amount of support. Just the problem for them was that most people didn't like them. So these guys get a plurality of support and they they get, they develop these very loyal followings that are, you know, what, 30-ish percent of the electorate. And so they can keep showing up, but they, they don't keep winning because at some point they just piss off everyone or a majority of people. So they, they lose because this is what happened this past year. The opposition parties finally realize that they need to agree on just, you know, removing the populist and, you know, you know, let's say, put the rest of the stuff that we disagree on aside, focus on this. And then we, we, we come together, we get them out of power. And that's what happened. I mean, so populists remain powerful uh, because again, they're charismatic. I mean, they be, they're like, I, mean, I think Trump is probably the single most loved politician. Like if you could make a scale of loved, like both the number of people, number of people times intensity of it, the most loved politician I mean, in way longer than my lifetime. I can't, I don't, I have maybe ever, I don't know, maybe, but probably since Abraham Lincoln, uh, something like that. But uh, yeah. Do you think then that um, in, in, in terms of that sort of like uh, love, that it's particularly intense because um, populists have a tendency to promise the heavens and the earth. And if they're not able to achieve that, it isn't actually their fault. It's due to the establishment messing things up and so that they won't be able to, you know, enact all these wonderful things that will make uh, their supporters' lives better. And so their supporters don't see them as having been failures. They say, oh, well, it's actually the, uh, the secret deep state's fault that they haven't been able to achieve these things and continue to quite often uh, support them. Yeah, I mean, lot that, but I mean, as this this vax stuff shows with Trump recently, I mean, I don't even, 
I'm not even sure how much their positions on stuff matter at once they've gotten this this audience. Hmm. I mean, some part, diehard supporters are going to be as diehard supporters, I think, almost no matter what. Hmm. I don't know, like, he would have to change so many of his positions. I mean, even if he changed a bunch of his positions, I don't think he'd lose the support because they just love the way he talks. I mean, the style, hmm. I think, is so attractive to a lot of people. I mean, this is a very hard but this is a very hard thing for people who do podcasts and write, you know, <laughs> write for, you know, the New York Times and stuff like this to understand is that this mm-hmm. style is just very attractive because these kind of people don't find this style attractive because, you know, they're like, you can't, you know, go out and swear in front of an audience of, you know, of supporters. You have to, you know, write an op-ed and, <laughs> and then you just, you can, you can yell at the, 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 the token right wing guy on the, the New York Times editorial board, but uh, you still can't swear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, we're coming to the end of the podcast. It's been great to have you on, uh, Brett, and I have one final question. Uh, we're in 2022 now. It's a, a new year in still a relatively uh, new decade. And though this might be a slightly unscientific thing to ask you, but if you were transported 10 years into the future, into 2032, what do you think, based on how things are at the moment, the state of populists and populism will be in the world? Well, I mean, I guess the, the right answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, well, she's Trump. Is Trump still, I mean, let's just even start with that. Is Trump still going to be around? I mean, there's, it's, it's, there's certainly odds that he, the odds that he runs in 2024 are very high. The odds that he wins are certainly non-zero. Mm. I mean, cause the Democrats, I don't think know what they're going to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, I think populism is here to stay. I mean, I don't know if anyone can pick it up from, I mean, populism in the United States is here mm. to stay. I don't know if anyone can pick it up from Trump because no one has Trump's level of charisma. He is, mm. is he's an original. Um, he's an American original. Um, he really is. I mean, he's like, yeah, um, something to think about. And it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. But I mean, around the rest of the world, I mean, it depends on like what happens. And here's a generic answer that's still <laughs> meaningful. It depends on what happens with the economy in these places. If you start to have these like big <laughs> shakeups again, if we, I don't know, if if the inflation that we have, if all this like this asset price inflation really deflates at some point, maybe you know we have a huge hit. We could have a huge hit to people's retirement accounts. Hmm. You could have you know a lot of people losing jobs. I mean, the situation we have right now, where you can get any job you want is, you know, unprecedented. This is clearly not going to last. So, I mean, how hard we fall from this, if we fall pretty hard, which we could, there you go, populist. I mean, then you, then I mean, like a yeah. Bernie Sanders guy becomes much more appealing in this country. I mean, there's still a chance for a guy like that in the future in this country. There's certainly, a, I mean, Latin America has guys like this all the time. I mean, yeah. I know there, the economies there are a bit different than here in Western Europe, but I mean, yeah, something like this definitely brings populism back there. Uh, mm-hmm. And in Western Europe, I mean, I think this, this is sort of like, you know, these guys consistently do quite well. I mean, like in Sweden, the Sweden Democrats are going to get probably over 20 percent of the vote in the election this some later this year. Yeah. I forgot exactly when mm-hmm. um, that's, you know, in, in Sweden, that's mostly based on immigration and you know the difficulties with assimilation and that kind of stuff. But uh, I mean, this underlying economic issues, like certain groups, you know, doing worse in the, you know, new information, the new knowledge economy, yeah. that's going to continue. I mean, yeah, all these, these, uh, well, I mean, there's going to be a lot of good Amazon, you know, a million different jobs at Amazon that, <laughs> yeah. that employ a lot of these people. I think that's a big part of the reason why things have been so good because you have such an expansion of like these low, lower, lower skill, if you mm. will, jobs. Um, that's, you know, taking a lot of pressure off the labor market. We'll see how well that holds. Uh, if there's an economic downturn, I mean, people are still going to want to get packages delivered. So mm-hmm. maybe it holds reasonably well, but I mean, I, th- yeah, that stuff could, there, there's the kind of stuff that could go wrong. And if it does, then populism, I mean, both left and right wing populism are going to be, you know, very appealing. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that's what it depends on. I mean, how rocky the future is economically. That's a big determining factor here. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you once again for coming on the podcast, Brett. If people want to read uh, your most recent paper from the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, where should they go to read it? And if people want to find out more about you, where should they go uh, to find out more about you? 
Well, let's see. You can go to our website. I mean, you can just search for Playbook Against Populism mm -hmm. on Google. That's the easiest yeah. way to do yeah. it. That's even how I find it because I can't ever remember the, the like exact website. I mean, I put this stuff on my personal website, which is brettandrewmeyer.com, uh, which has all of my reports. Actually, I haven't put this one on my website, so I should do that today. But it has all my other reports. It has some of my academic articles. And if you're interested in golf, it has my extensive collection of reviews of golf courses. Uh, so uh, <laughs> um, that, uh, you, can, you can always go there. But uh, I mean, yeah, you can follow the Institute on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Bam. What is it? Bread and Bam, whatever it is. Um, and uh, yeah, those are some places if you're interested in hearing more about this. And like I said at the beginning, my colleagues do some fantastic work. You should... I mean, a lot of my, my immediate colleagues in our section renewing the center do terrific work on UK policy. So I would suggest following them if you're interested in that. Excellent. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast, Brett. Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, debated podcast and if you'd like to get in touch with us whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast or commenting on an episode that you've listened to you can do so at the debated podcast at gmail.com thank you for listening i hope you listen to the next one